not camera, Mr. Miller. Okay. to 
worship you and praise you for that wonderful gift. And God, we pray now that you would send your Holy Spirit down to fill up the sanctuary and to fill up the hearts of everyone here this morning. And we pray also that you would be with us as we pray the prayer that your disciples, that Jesus taught your, his disciples to send, to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. The prayer of confession is printed in the bulletin. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past outside of you. Open us to a future in you, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. We'll take a few moments for a silent confession. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Thanks be to God. And now that we have been forgiven, we can have peace with God and each other. Share a sign of peace with our forgiven brothers and sisters in Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Take a few moments to share God's peace, then we'll join together and sing hymn 210, Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all the gifts and the blessings which you have been given to us. We thank you for our health, for the food, the clothing, the shelter, and the talents which you've given us. And God, we pray as we return a portion of those gifts to you, that you would receive them, that you would work through them, and use them to spread your gospel message. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. gift you got three years ago. Go! A mustard, monster high doll. Okay, three years ago, go! Wow, that's pretty dry up here. 
Okay, here's another question. What was the best Christmas gift you got 2,000 years ago? Go! Well, I know the answer to that one. The best Christmas gift that we got 2,000 years ago was the first Christmas present, and that was the baby Jesus. And these Christmas gifts that we get this year, that we got three years ago, that we got nine years ago, are meant to be a reminder of the gift that we got from God that first Christmas when he sent his son Jesus down to live a life that we could never live and pay a penalty that we could never pay. So as you get those gifts, even if you can't remember what your favorite Christmas gifts are, try to remember the best gift that first Christmas. Can you remember that? I hope so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the gifts that you give us. We especially thank you for the gift that you gave us that first Christmas. And we pray that all these gifts that we receive each and every time will be a reminder of Jesus and that first gift that you gave. We ask all of this in his name. Amen. You could be dismissed to go to kids church or you can stay in the sanctuary if you like.
we pray for safe travel, not only for them as they return home, but our, our other loved ones who will be on the roads as well. I want uh, Tiffany and Abel on the furniture in music. It's my granddaughter. So out in Texas. <laughs> they got bad weather out there. Yeah, Texas got quite a bit of snow, as I understand it. So we'll be praying for Tiffany Nagel, your granddaughter, who's in need of some intervention from God. Thank God for Carol and for the service that she's doing with the choir. Thanks that uh, your grandson made it back from California. He's in the Marine Corps, correct? So praise, praise God that he was brought safely back and uh, for a good stay while he's here. And what's your grandson's name? Eugene Anthony. Eugene. Okay. Good name. <laughs> <laughs> faces that Christmas brings. So yeah, Mother, can, I, can I pray for uh, uh, the sur more surrender, surrender of my will and, uh, and more clarity of God's will? So prayers that uh, God will help you surrender your will and, and turn your life completely over to Him and let Him be your, your guide and your, your compass. More and more on a daily basis. Thanks that Margaret Jacobs is back home yes. uh, after her knee uh, surgery. No, her back surgery. Her back surgery. So thanks that Margaret Jacobs is back home and recovering from surgery. I'm glad to see Jen Tony's granddaughter and husband here. They're from where they come from. Tennessee. I'm glad to see you here from Tennessee. Welcome. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you that you are a God who knows each one of us. You know our, our faults and our shortcomings, and yet you still love us. You love us enough to hear our prayers and to know what it is that we're going to ask even before we ask it. So God, we pray now that you would hear our prayers, that you would uh, allow your will to be done. And God, we're thankful that uh, you brought us all here this morning. We're especially thankful for uh, those that are, that are visiting or who might be here for the first time. And we pray that uh, you would uh, be a guide for, for each one of them, uh, that you would help them to, to surrender their lives and, and turn themselves over to you so that your will can be done in them and so that your will can be done through them. And God, we pray for uh, Tiffany Nagel, that you would take action in her life, that uh, the help that she needs would, would be given and that she would see your hand working in her situation and she would praise you and give thanks to you for the work that you do. We're also thankful that you interceded on behalf of Carol Jacobs and her successful surgery, and we're thankful that you brought her home and uh, she's able to recover at home. We pray that you will continue to be with her and, and help her through her recovery. We're thankful that you gave Eugene safe travel back from California, and we pray that you would be with him during his stay here, that you would uh, help him to enjoy his time visiting with his family and friends. We're thankful for the safe travel that you gave to Carol and, and uh, to all the visitors that we have this morning. So Father, we pray that you would be with them and uh, keep them in your hand, that you would take them safely back to, to the place that they call home. 
God, we lift these prayers up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we move now to the congregational choice of hymns. So what will our first hymn lead this morning? Hymn 509. So we'll sing together the first and last verses of hymn 509, He Lifted Me. Some super engine added to it, 
It might be a set of wings or a collection of high-tech weapons. Some of the sets are completely taken apart, and with parts from another set, they're recreated into cars, planes, trucks, trains, forts, houses, or whatever suits their fancy that particular day. Now we know that Lego sets are a good gift in our house, and we know that they're a gift that's guaranteed to be enjoyed for years to come. But gift giving wasn't always that easy for us. When one of the boys was a toddler, all he wanted was a toy that was called the Shake and Go Racer. And all he ever talked about was how badly he wanted that toy. In fact, when he spoke with people, he would tell them, I'm six years old and I want Shake and Go Racers. It was a pretty neat toy that had a little plastic track that was snapped together in a figure eight, and it came with a couple of cars, and as the name suggests, you would shake those cars and set them on the track and they would race around. Now, shaking them would create some kind of inertia in the car, and they would race until whatever was wound up became unwound, and you'd have to pick them up and shake them again. Now, I'm sure that my son's fascination started with seeing some 30-second commercial in which a child shook the car and watched it race around the track for the entire duration of the commercial. So when Christmas arrived that year, of course, there was a shake-and-go race set underneath the tree. Now, he tore that box open, and we put together the set, he shook the car, set it down on the track, and watched it race around until it stopped. And it was probably then that the disappointment set in. Because what that 30-second commercial didn't show was that you have to keep shaking those cars to keep them going. It wasn't a once-and-done thing. It takes some effort to keep them going around the track. Now that gift, which was the reason for so much anticipation and excitement for our son, was eventually relegated to a corner in the bedroom. Though it was occasionally pulled out and played with, it eventually became just a dust collector. And once that toy was outgrown, it was passed along and soon forgotten. Now oftentimes Jesus is treated that same way. Sure, many people get excited to celebrate his birth on Christmas morning. We plan and prepare the decorating, the shopping, and the holiday meal. And when that day finally arrives, we celebrate with friends and family. But afterwards, we take all those decorations down and we put everything away for another year, oftentimes putting Christ on that same shelf. We go about our lives without another thought. As we look at our reading in the book of Luke this morning, we'll look at the first days of Jesus' life. We'll see how two people in particular anticipated the gift that was received on that first Christmas. In Luke chapter 2, we'll see how those two people waited for that gift and what they did when that gift was finally received. We'll also consider the gift that we have been given, and we'll consider how we are to respond. So if you're able, please stand as we read Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. 
There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew up and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So after Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph traveled the six miles from Bethlehem to the temple in Jerusalem. The law of Moses required that the mother of a newborn male child remain at home because she was considered to be unclean for 40 days. After the 40-day period, she was to go to the temple and offer a sacrifice of a lamb and a dove in order to be made clean. Mary and Joseph were poor, humble people, so the law allowed them to offer a less expensive sacrifice of two doves instead of the more expensive lamb. Through the sacrifice of those doves, the priest would make atonement for Mary's sins and she would be declared clean. As the firstborn son of Mary and Joseph, the law also required that Jesus be consecrated or dedicated, set aside to God. Firstborn animals had to be slaughtered as a sacrifice to God, but firstborn sons were consecrated through payment of five shekels of silver, which in today's market is about $28. The law did not require that the child be present for the consecration, but Mary knew that he was special, and she brought Jesus to present him to God. So Mary, having given birth to the baby Jesus under the law of Moses, would satisfy everything that the law requires her to do, and Jesus' perfect, sinless life would begin. In the temple on this particular day was a man called Simeon. The Bible doesn't mention Simeon before this day, but he's described as righteous and devout. God had previously spoken to him through the Holy Spirit, telling him that he would not die until he sees the Messiah the one who would deliver Israel and save them from their sins. Simeon was led to the temple on this particular day by the Holy Spirit, and as he was waiting in the courtyard, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus in to make their offering. Again inspired by the Holy Spirit, Simeon takes the baby Jesus in his arms and praises God for fulfilling the promise that he made to him and to all people, declaring Jesus to be a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory of your people Israel. And also in the temple that day was an 84-year-old widow, the prophetess Anna. And like Simeon, Anna was also a godly person, who according to scripture, never left the temple. And now the temple was a very large building with all sorts of different rooms that were used for various purposes. And because of her status as a prophetess, she may have been allowed to live in one of the many rooms, or the, or the verse may mean that she spent every waking moment in the temple. But regardless, the Bible specifically mentions how she worshipped God night and day with fasting and with praying. Now Anna was a woman with great faith who was very obedient to God. And though it doesn't say so in our text, we can conclude that she too, like Simeon, had received a revelation from God. And we know this because the Holy Spirit led her to Mary and Joseph that day. She immediately gave thanks to God for the baby Jesus, and she began speaking about him to all the others who were gathered in the temple, people who were gathered there waiting for God to deliver them from their oppression of their sins, just as the Bible had promised. God made a promise to his chosen people all the way back when Adam and Eve first sinned in the garden, that he would save them from their sins. And he affirmed that promise with King David, and again later on through the prophets. He promised Simeon that not only would God save his people, but that Simeon would not die until he sees this wonderful gift, the Savior of the world. So how did Simeon respond to this promise that he received from God? The Bible described him as being devout and righteous. Devout, devout is defined in the dictionary as 
having or showing deep religious feeling or commitment. And righteous is defined as morally right or justifiable. Simeon was committed to God and had deep religious feelings. He was right under the law of Moses, which was God's law. He was also obedient to God. The Bible said that the Holy Spirit was upon him, meaning that he was directly controlled by God. He had submitted himself fully to God's will. The Bible also says that he was moved by the Holy Spirit to the temple that day. Simeon was obeying God and was going where he was directed to go. Anna was also full of the Holy Spirit. She's described as being a prophetess, someone who has been contacted by God and is speaking to his people on his behalf. She spent all of her time in the temple worshiping God and speaking with him through prayer. She demonstrated her faith further by fasting, refusing to eat to allow herself to better focus on God. The Holy Spirit brought her to the baby Jesus, and her first reaction was to give thanks to God. She recognized Jesus as the Savior of God's people, confirming to those present that everything Simeon said was true, confirming that God did what he, was prompt, what he promised to do. Two thousand years later, we can see that God has delivered on more of the promises that he gave us in the Bible. Unlike Simeon or Anna, we can look back on the entire life of Jesus, not just on his birth. We can see that, as promised, Jesus lived a sinless and a perfect life. We can see that he was beaten and nails were driven through his hands and through his feet into the cross where he was crucified for our sins. And we also know that, as promised, God raised Jesus from the dead and lifted him up to be with him in heaven. But we haven't seen the arrival of God's final promise yet. The promise that was revealed to us by the Holy Spirit through the Bible. Revealed to us through the teachings of our pastor to our Sunday school leaders. The promise that one day Jesus will come back and all people, living and dead, will be judged. Those who believe in him and have followed him as their Lord and Savior, who have sincerely tried to turn away from their sinful ways, will be given a new and perfect body. We'll be restored, and we will live with him in the new heaven and the new earth for all eternity. All evil will be defeated and destroyed forever. So Jesus was born, and what are we supposed to do next? Jesus called his first disciples by telling them, follow me. As those who have been given this promise, we have all become his disciples, so we are all to obey the command to follow him. We know that followers of Jesus, those who believe in him, are called Christians. A Christian is defined as an imitator of Christ, or a reflection of him. And following Jesus means more than worshiping him once a year at Christmas and putting him back up on a shelf. Following Jesus means that we are to obey his teachings, to love one another, to forgive, to be generous, to show mercy, and to have a pure heart. Following Jesus means that we are to spend time in prayer, not only in talking to God, but also in listening to Him. It means that we are to thank Him for the work that He has done, for the blessings He has given. It means that we are to give Him our worries and our fears, and that we are to have faith that He will carry us through the difficulties in our life. Followers of Jesus are also to, to nourish their faith. And that nourish comes from reading and studying God's Word in the Bible. It also comes from receiving sound instruction from Sunday school, from Bible study, or from Bible-based radio and television programs. It comes from gathering together here in church to worship with like-minded believers and fostering relationships with those like-minded believers who can support us when we're weak. The nourishment of our faith is the food that helps us to grow in our discipleship and in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the fuel that powers us so that we can be the hands, the feet, and the voice of God so that we can go and spread that gospel message. Those shake-and-go racers needed to be shaken to propel them through the twists and turns and the highs and the lows that were on that little racetrack. And nourishing our faith is like shaking one of those shake-and-go racers. It creates the inertia that propels us through the twists and turns and the highs and lows that we face in life. I heard a story one time about a man who bought a brand new car. 
He drove that car away from the dealership and showed it off to everyone that he met. He dutifully washed it and waxed it so that it looked presentable. And he was always a careful driver. He looked both ways at stop signs. He always used his turn signal and he never drove over the speed limit. Everything was great with that car until one day it just stopped. Now the man's anger rose as he tried and tried, but the car just wouldn't start. So he finally called a tow truck and had the car towed back to the dealership where he bought it. He, fought, he found the salesman from whom he bought the car, and he expressed his frustration to that man. The salesman met with the mechanic and came back to speak with the man. The salesman asked the man what he had been doing since he brought the car and drove it home. So the man told him how he washed it and waxed it, how carefully he drove it, how he always used his turn signal, and how he never exceeded the speed limit. The salesman listened carefully and nodded his head, and then he asked the man, Did you ever put gas in it? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ was a wonderful gift from God on that first Christmas morning. So let's remember how that gift was a fulfillment of the promise that was made to Simeon, to Anna, and to all of God's people. Remember how Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, paying the penalty for our sins, was the fulfillment of another promise. Let us look forward to the fulfillment of God's final promise when Jesus comes back to judge all the earth. Let's look forward to that promise with patience and with faith, obediently doing everything that Jesus taught us to do. And while we're looking forward to the fulfillment of that promise, let us continue to move and continue to act on behalf of Jesus and continue to nourish our faith and grow in our relationship with Him. As we leave the church today, I would encourage everyone here to prayerfully examine yourself, search yourself, and find where you are in your relationship with Jesus. And no matter where you are in that relationship, whether you're a new Christian or one who was raised in the church, there is still something that you can do. As your relationship with Jesus strengthens, you are being equipped by God to serve Him. And the stronger your relationship is, the more equipment that you'll have. When God gave us the promise, we were also called to serve Him. And God equips us to do that which we were called to do. Are you doing everything that you can do to serve Him today? If you don't yet feel equipped to act, what are you doing to gain that which you feel you don't have? God has revealed His promise to us, so let us faithfully draw closer to Him, to worship Him, and to serve Him until that final promise from Him is fulfilled. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, You are the one true God who is faithful in Your promises. We thank You for sending us a Savior to redeem us from our own sins, just as You promised. We pray that you would give us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us, to help us grow in our relationship with him, and to help us to be better imitators of Jesus. Give us the strength and endurance that we need to finish that race which you have laid out for us until that day when Jesus returns to judge us all. And we pray that when he returns, he will find us doing that which we were created to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now we'll continue our worship by joining together to sing hymn number 56, To God Be the Glory. Hymn number 56. <laughs>
And now, may you go with the love of God the Father, the grace of His Son Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.